When these things begin to come to pass, look up, lift up your heads, because your redemption is at hand. Words taken from today's Holy Gospel and from the Collect, we hear this beautiful prayer. Stir up thy power, we beseech thee, O Lord, and come, that from the threatening dangers of our sins, by thy protection, we may deserve to be rescued and be saved by thy deliverance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, amen. On July 30th, 1945, the cruiser, the USS Indianapolis, was torpedoed by a lone Japanese submarine. She sank quickly, taking only 12 minutes to go down. Due to the circumstances of her sinking, the Indianapolis holds a special place in history. Among other things, she had just delivered the critical parts of the first atomic bomb to be used over Japan. She delivered it to Tinian Island. This huge ship was also the last major vessel to be sunk in the Second World War, and this sinking led to the greatest single loss of life at sea in the history of the U.S. Navy. Of the 1,196 crewmen aboard, approximately 300 went down with the ship. The remaining 900 men faced exposure, dehydration, and shark attacks as they awaited rescue. Floating on the open sea using primarily life jackets and a few small lifeboats with almost no food or water over four days. Of the original crew, only 316 sailors survived. Among the heroes of the sinking were the Navy chaplain, Father Thomas Conway, and the Marine captain, Edward Park. They both remained with the largest detachment of survivors, making them form a circle on the ocean. And they swam constantly among the men to encourage them, as well as prevent them from doing something foolish. Father Conway also did all he could to reconcile as many men with God as possible with all the strength he could muster. These heroic men had to overcome several problems among the sailors, namely thirst, sharks, and hallucinations brought on by exposure. As a result of thirst, many sailors gave up the battle and drank deeply of the seat water, which in that part of the ocean was particularly dangerous and even corrosive to the body on the outside. Not long after satisfying their burning thirst, these poor men went into shock, foamed at the mouth, and died, becoming fodder for the sharks. What is more, many others suffered from various hallucinations, often seeing the Indy, the ship that just sank, with all her running lights on just below the water's surface, as if all were well and everyone on board was having a grand old time. Giving in to this very inviting temptation, this hallucination, they took off their life jackets to go down and join the fun below. They did not return. Father Conway and Captain Park did their best to make the boys realize the dangers, the utter peril they were in. Making every effort to help them fight off the sharks and prevent them from drinking the waters and taking off their life jackets. They both died from exhaustion in their efforts. These faithful men are an image of the zealous priest, zealous parent or teacher in our time. They are, as it were, these good people paddling in floodwaters that are both deadly, corrosive, and yet alluring. Waters filled with lies and falsehoods and the revolutionary grammar of lust. Flowing freely in the mass media, movie houses, internet streams, news outlets, radio stations, college campuses, extraordinarily so, and so on and so forth everywhere. Many of the faithful, especially the young, Want so much to drink from these waters, thirsting for novelties and new experiences 
and really just to be accepted by the world. Why can't we just be like everybody else we hear? Well, because most people are living in a state of sin. That's why most people are drowned. Many others want to dive down into the waters to join the fun on board the pleasure ships sunk below the surface. They're having a grand old time down there. They take off their life jacket, mortal sin, and join the fun. The zealous priest, parent, teacher has to work with all his strength, even unto his last breath, it seems, to convince, to try to save as many souls as possible from such deadly and often subtle dangers. The words of St. Catherine of Siena, written to a great prelate, come to mind. She said, I desire to see a hunger for the salvation of souls grow so much in you that you will die of it. Sad to say, many priests and religious, parents and teachers in our time, seem rather to have taken off their life vests and joined in the fun below rather than fighting against it. They gave in to the hallucinations. The four weeks of Advent, the four weeks of Advent are upon us. These weeks are set apart by the church to commemorate the ages that intervene between the fall of our first parents, Adam and Eve, and the birth of Christ our King, which we celebrate at Christmas. It's a season of special prayer and penance mingled with joyful expectation calculated to prepare our souls for a worthy keeping of the great solemnity of Christmas. Advent is also the beginning of the ecclesiastical year. As each succeeding year brings us closer to the second coming of Christ as judge of the world, this holy time is likewise intended to make us ready to meet our judge. We will be ready to meet him if we keep on our life jackets. That is, if we remain in a state of grace and do not give in to drinking from the floodwaters in which we're forced to swim at this time. Oh, how easy it is just to take off that jacket and join in the fun below. But that is the path of spiritual suicide. We may never see you again if you do that. There's no guarantee God's going to call you back to confession. As we just heard, Advent is about coming, the second coming of Christ. Why must he come again? Among other reasons, he must come to open the earth and make it take all these floodwaters back to itself forever never to come up again and harass his flock. He is coming again to put an end to the sharks, that is the devils and all their cruelty. He is coming again to put an end to all the lies and falsehoods and tricks of these alluring yet corrosive floodwaters. He is coming to save his followers definitively with no more shark attacks, dehydration and hallucinations possible. He's coming to satisfy our unquenchable thirst for the divine, for the eternal. He is coming to save definitively those who love their souls more than their bodies. Those who loved and chose the spiritual over the carnal. When he comes, hell, the center of the earth, the sewer of the universe will take unto itself all its own. It will be locked up permanently forever and ever. What a glorious moment that will be. No wonder he himself tells us to look up and lift up our heads at this moment when it happens. He will come with great glory, majesty, and power. But only those in a state of grace will look up and lift up their heads and hearts and welcome this king. 
in order to be counted among those that are saved, the sheep, the elect of God, we must possess grace in our souls. We need that life jacket. Otherwise, we will drink in, imbibe the lying, lust-filled waters of this world. We will foam at the mouth, go into shock and die. And we may just let go or cut loose and just dive down, never to be seen again. To prevent this from happening, to keep on our life jacket, our eternal life preserver, it is important to appreciate just what it is. Let us then spend a little time considering the importance of saving souls, starting with our own. And the beauty of a soul in a state of grace. Then we will understand why Father Conway worked so hard to keep his men from committing suicide by taking off their life preservers. St. Joan of Arc comes to mind. She highly valued this eternal life preserving garment stating an answer to a question posed to her as to whether or not she was in a state of grace. It was a trick question, but she answered as no one else has ever answered. It's the best answer ever given in the entire history of the church. If I am in a state of grace, may God so keep me. If I am not, may God so place me. I would rather die than not be in the love of God. St. Joan of Arc. St. Catherine of Siena, doctor of the church, also comes to our aid. She explains to a priest the worth and beauty of the human soul. She says, Father, if you had seen the beauty of the rational soul, I have no doubt that you would be ready to undergo bodily death a hundred times over if that were possible, to save one soul. Nothing on this earth can compare with such beauty. Nothing on this earth can compare with such beauty. Even apart from grace, St. Catherine is telling us the human soul is worth more than the entire material universe. St. John of the Cross says the cosmos, the universe is a palace for the bride. It's a palace. It is not the bride. The bride is the church, as well as our souls, the souls of her individual members. That's the bride. The universe, in other words, is made for man. Man is not made for the universe. What does that say about this modern environmentalism? It's inverted. It's a palace. The bride's more important. People came to St. Catherine from all around, such that Pope Gregory XI, longing for souls to return to God, by letters apostolic, granted the Dominican friar, Blessed Raymond of Capua, and two of his confreres, the faculties of absolving, even in cases reserved to bishops, the sinners who met Catherine's gaze and felt impelled to go immediately to confession. There were such crowds of penitents around her that many a day the priests could not even leave the confessionals for meals. Why is this? Through Catherine, they learned of their sins. They realized they had drowned. That they were in need of putting on their life vests if they were to be rescued from the sharks. Very often they were not slow in doing so. Thus the reason for all the penitence. Standing before St. Catherine, there was no pretending. Either one was in a state of grace or he hurried off to confession. St. Catherine was not shy in longing for all souls to be baptized in order to be put on that eternal life-preserving garment of grace. To a Jewish man, she didn't say, oh, you're fine where you are. You can be saved in your own religion. She didn't say that. Not at all. This is what she said. My soul longs to see you reach the light of holy baptism as a panting deer longs for running water. Get baptized. 
There was in Siena an old woman who came to hate Catherine for utterly selfish reasons. Her name was Palmarina. This poor woman never missed an opportunity to calumniate in the worst ways and curse this young saint. Catherine, acutely aware of this, did all she could to win over this enemy by tactful service, humility, and charity. But to no avail. Her friendly overtures only met with contempt and sarcasm, and it was not long when Paul Marina fell ill and began to approach her end. Although Catherine hastened to her aid, treating her with even more kindness, affection, attention, and eager devotion, Paul Marina would not relent and seemed likely to go to her grave without the sacraments. Still consumed with hatred, she was on her way to the sewer. She was already tasting of its waters. Hatred filled her soul. When Catherine saw that she could not touch the dying woman's stony heart, she resolved instead to win over her judge, her divine judge. She herself would pay whatever was needed to ransom this soul. She would save it from God's justice and turn it over to his mercy. After a great struggle, swimming constantly, as it were, St. Catherine reached heroic levels of virtue and won the graces of conversion for this mean-spirited old woman who most of us, if not all of us, even all of us combined would have abandoned. The heck with her. She then hastened to the bedside of this dying Palmarina, whose long agony had contradicted all the laws of nature. She should have been dead, but she did not die and astonished those around her. She was waiting for Catherine. God wouldn't let her die. But even more astonishing still were the joy and respect with which she received the unsummoned Catherine, whom she had hitherto hated so much. A short while later, the sick woman died peacefully, reconciled with God and man. Then, lifting the veil that hides the spiritual world from the eyes, His Majesty Christ showed His saint the soul she had just saved. Although it had not yet entered heaven, possessing only the splendor of its rational nature, supernaturalized by the life jacket of God's grace, it was so beautiful that no human description could do it justice. It was so beautiful, Catherine went into a rapture immediately, as all the saints have done when they see the soul in a state of grace. St. Teresa would go into a rapture if she saw a soul, if God revealed to what it looked like. How beautiful is a soul in a state of grace. This is what the Lord said to Catherine. Dearest daughter, See how through you I have retrieved this soul that was already lost. Does it not look very gracious and beautiful to you? Who then would not undergo any labor whatsoever to win so lovely a creature? If I, who am the sovereign beauty from whom all other beauty comes, was so enamored of the beauty of souls that I will to come down to earth and shed my own blood to redeem them. How much more ought you to work for one another so as not to allow such beautiful creatures to be lost? I showed you this soul to make you more fervent in procuring the salvation of every soul and to induce you to lead others to do this work according to the grace that will be given to you. Let us then, dearly beloved, Use our advent to secure our souls from these flood waters by keeping it a spiritual season, a preparation, more than a time of material preparation, by making a good confession and ever striving to help God and Our Lady save souls. Then we will be able to Stay afloat. Avoid entering the sewer system of the cosmos. And we will be among those who look up and lift up our heads when the time comes for the judge to return. Stir up thy power, we beseech thee, O Lord, and come. 
that from the threatening dangers of our sins, by thy protection, we may deserve to be rescued and be saved by thy deliverance. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.